and welcome to the Bloody Disgusting Network. The following show is just horrifying. Beware. My friendship to all of you precludes my involvement with any one of you. But if you want to make love, then I do too, and I'll be right there behind you. Hey everyone, Randall here. What you're about to hear is a chat with one of my favorite podcasters, commentators, cultural critics, Will Meneker of the Chapo Trap House podcast. If you're familiar with Chapo, you might be wondering why we asked Will on a Stephen King podcast. That's a good question. The simple answer is that I think he's smart, he's funny, and when I saw him tweet about how he was reading The Stand, I said, well, hey, why not see if he wants to talk about it with us? And yeah, we talk about The Stand, but we also touch on a question that's been on my mind a lot as we enter this uh, post-accident era of King's life, is that will there ever be another Stephen King? Can a novelist in 2022 achieve that same level of pop ubiquity? The way we consume art is so different now, so is the nature of celebrity. The webbing that used to separate literature and pop entertainment is thinner now than it's ever been. So how does King slot into all of that? How do you characterize his influence? What modern culture figures are demonstrating that same kind of influence? These are questions that I want to chase um, kind of in the foreseeable future of this podcast as we, you know, discuss his books and and, uh, movies in this post-accident era. And Will is a great person to discuss that with. I mean, one of the things I love about Chapo is that he and his co-hosts know how to I guess, distill cultural and political touchstones by filtering them through history and context to, I don't know, help reach a better understanding of their impact. And he's also just super funny. So anyways, um, I guess keep those questions on your mind as you, you know, listen, uh, you know, over the next year or two years, who knows how long we'll be doing this pod. And yeah, obviously let us know um, in the Discord or online or wherever if you have any thoughts on this, because I think it's a cool question and it's kind of a really interesting way to, I think, engage with pop culture uh, in 2022 and sort of the evolutions that have happened is by uh, turning to people like King and also like we discuss in this episode, people like Steven Spielberg, who, you know, if you're an elder millennial like myself, you probably have known these names for the majority of your life. And I think examining their evolution against sort of the evolution of pop culture is, I don't know, cool way to approach it. So anyways, I hope you enjoy this chat. Bye-bye. Hey, everyone. Randall here, joined by Mike. Say hi, Mike. Hey, how you doing? (laughs) Uh, Today we are joined by one of my favorite podcasters, cultural critics, writers, and practitioners of movie mindset. His name is Will Meneker, and he is a co-host of the Chapo Trap House podcast and a New York Times bestselling author. Will, say hello. Thank you. I think that was the... uh... The highest quality introduction I've ever gotten on a uh, podcast. <laughs> so uh, thank you for that, uh, Randall and Mike. I will be your uh, your flag hag for today's show. <laughs> nice, uh, Randall. Randall flag. That's right. Uh, yeah. So I just I guess to straight up front, I I wanted to say there's a few reasons I wanted to bring you onto our podcast. Uh, one is I enjoy you and your uh, co-host approach to culture, specifically pop culture, and uh, the way you guys place it in sort of. Uh, its impact on modern political and social discourse. And secondly, I saw you tweet uh, about reading The Stand. And I was like, hey, I want to talk to Will about The Stand. So uh, before we get into a broader discussion about King, I want to ask, how is your read of The Stand going? It is very, very long. Okay, yeah, and I'm reading the like uh, the expanded edition. It's, oh, it's, God. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's 1,400 pages long. I think I'm about like... A little over, like I don't know, almost halfway done with it. I, I just like, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm plugging away at it though. I, ha- I have, I, I did have to put it down though. I had to take a break though because I'm reading it, uh, on a Kindle, and the Kindle tells you how many, like, how much time is left in the yeah. chapter. <laughs> and you know, like I, I, like I flip over to a new chapter, and it's like you know, uh, the Mother Abigail chapter, and it's like an hour and forty minutes left. And I'm yeah. just like, 
I was just like, okay, I think I need to take a break. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Is that so, the one where yeah. is that the one where she's like going to get chickens and stuff to make for dinner and she's like walking back and forth between the two houses or something like that? Like, yeah, yeah. So, okay. so there's a lot yeah. of that going on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is the longest chapter ever written in any book, yeah. by the <laughs> yeah. way. So uh if you get through that, it is an accomplishment in itself. Um I will say though, the stand is is uh is is a really great book. It was my first King book that I ever read when I was, I think, in sixth grade. And uh, for a lot of our listeners, it was their first book as well. I guess I'm curious, what prompted you to read it? And I assume it's not your first King book, but if it is, um, I guess your first impressions. No, it's, it's not my first King book. I, I like I, I, I mainly read uh, uh, like the Stephen King books I have read. I read when I was uh, much younger, and I think I was... Um, just two and say like the the two big big King books that I feel everyone is sort of their entry point like it and the stand. I was just sort of too intimidated by the length at that age. I was just like, uh, just look at all these pages. How the hell fuck am I ever going to read this? But I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what prompted me to. I mean, I don't know. I think I think I was looking for a new book to read, and I figured like, hey, why not just like uh, try some Stephen King and why not tackle like the biggest Stephen King book? And I think it's just uh, I probably picked it up. I probably chose the stand just because I don't know. It feels so. Feels so timely uh, to the world we're currently living in, you know. I mean, I remember um, when our uh, 2020 Democratic primary tour ended, and it was like, you know, Super Tuesday had um, er er erased basically any hope of a uh, better future, and COVID happened at the same uh -huh. time. I uh, flew back uh, to New York from California watching the TNT Stand miniseries on my laptop because <laughs> I think like that just it just it just felt appropriate. And, you know, as now, now, you know, two, two and a half years on into this fucking pandemic, I figured I want as well just finally I got some time crack open the actual book, The Stand. Well, it's weird because like when we we've, we always have listeners that come in and tell us about like our stand coverage from like 2017. And honestly, like we kind of started this podcast as a way to get away from. A lot of the, I don't know, we, we were in the media at the time and we were all kind of having a fucking headache just covering <laughs> all the shit that we usually had to cover. Just be like, isn't this bad? And blah, blah, blah. And I think we just were like, let's just talk about Stephen King. And I think in the stand episodes, we were talking about, yeah, it wouldn't kind of fucking suck if uh, the pand if some sort of pandemic hit uh, during this type of this, this, especially this administration right now, like it's we, we, who, who the fuck knows what they would even, how did they would even react to this? So we spent like a long deal talking about, it, and I guess now we always get hit up with listeners being like, "You guys predicted the pandemic or something like that." And it was just <laughs> like, you know, so it, it's it's definitely yeah, yeah. a harrowing book to read during right now. But yeah, yeah, St Stephen King predicted the pandemic, and I gotta say, uh, having you know read a good chunk of the stand, having seen both the TV series adaptations of it, I gotta think. Uh, you know, there's a certain uh, there's a certain benefit to Captain Trips in that it kills like 99 percent of the world population <laughs> in like two weeks rather than just kill a million people over like two and a half years. And it seemingly never yeah. goes away. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's just yeah. It's a good point. Just get it all done with. So you've watched both. Uh, miniseries adaptations. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. Uh, had you seen the t the original one from 1994 yeah. when you were younger? Oh yeah, yeah, I, I yeah, no, I, I said when I was younger, not all of it because it was so long. And then I think when I was like, I think I was in college or something. TNT just ran like an all day marathon, and I, I watched all of it then. And I really, I really quite like the uh, the 90s TNT one because it's just like, you know, like I did that Mick Garris thing where it's just like. It, it, it's 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 hokey. It's a little bit corny, but I think he gets Stephen King exactly right. And there are some very very yeah. affecting parts of the TNT miniseries. The new CBS series I thought was terrible, and mm -hmm. I'll tell you yeah. I'll, 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 I'll tell you why. Um, like from the very first scene of the first episode, the bifurcated timeline structure where they're showing you like half everything after at Captain Trips and then half everything before it really, really robs, I think, like a lot of the narrative power of the story of like totally. experiencing and watching society collapse and not knowing where it's going. And then and then also knowing like who survives and who doesn't um, yeah. like from the get go. Um, yeah, I just thought it didn't work. And also, I like, you know, I like Alexander Sarsgaard a lot, but I thought he just wasn't he did not do Randall Flagg for me at all because he's just like, I don't know, he's just sort of grim handsome Scandinavianness. He didn't have this sort of anarchaic, like sort of uh, like goofy huckster quality to Randall Flagg that I thought Jamie Sheridan um, did really well. And now reading the book and reading the, you know, the Flagg chapters, um, 
I thought he really got that right because he, he he's sort of like a Looney Tunes character. He's this sort of grinning, absolutely uh, menacing um, sort of clown. I mean, like sort of uh, yeah, he's he's a little bit Jokerified, and I just thought Sarsgaard had no sense of humor um, to the Randall Flag character at all. That's so true. That that really aligns with where we landed on them as well. We did weekly coverage of the stand. CBS series and we god damn it we wanted to like it so bad like it's kind of funny to listen to it as we did it week to week because we were like well maybe this will pay off sadly it never did we yeah we much more prefer the 94 version and Jamie Sheridan's performance specifically the fun thing about Randall Flagg is you're right he's a huckster he's an opportunist is I think the the kind of key thing um are you aware that that character appears throughout more King books and he's part of the larger universe? Yes. Um, uh, Matt has schooled me because like, you, you guys have got to have Matt on because I think he really has read the most Stephen King books. Like, I've only read a handful. I, I read the, uh, the Dead Zone and Salem's Lot when okay. I was like in, in junior high. And then like, my, and my favorites were the, uh, the short story collections, like The mm-hmm. Night Shift and Skeleton Crew. I, I like those a lot. Uh, but like, yeah, I've only now just just um, got back into like uh, reading Stephen King and reading The Stand. But yeah, Matt is not just a Stephen King fan, but he is a huge, like probably the biggest fan of the Dark Tower series. Mm-hmm. And he has nice. let me know. He has let me know that Randall Flagg is, you know, uh, makes quite an appearance throughout that like sort of mega mega mythology that, that King created. Yeah, it's cool. And yeah, I've heard on Chapo episodes, you guys talk about the path of the beam and I always perk up a little <laughs> bit of that. I'm like, I'm like, we got some King fans there. Uh, yeah, the the Dark Tower is uh, really fascinating. And, and I'll talk to you about getting Matt on the show. That would be a blast. But you said too, I think when you were on Twitter that you were reading a, like a, a series of pandemic books, like pandemic literature in general. Are there any others that you read that you took anything away from? How does the stand stack against them so far? Oh, did I? Uh, shit, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, I could be mistaken. Uh, no, I, 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 I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, if, if I did tweet that, I, I don't know what I was referring to. But uh, yeah, like the maybe there's a. God, no, I, it's just nothing's coming to me right now. I'm sorry. Sorry about oh, that. Oh, that's fellas. fine. Oh, that's fine. We could move past that one. Uh, so, um. Uh, I guess, like, what was your first, when you think back to when you were younger, like, what was your first exposure to Stephen King? Like, you said you read Salem's Lot, you said you read The Dead Zone, but the thing about King is he's kind of larger than life. He's, um, he sort of has transcended his books in a lot of ways. Is he a figure that you encountered first as a personality, or was it his actual work? Yeah, I think, I think it was just like, I think, I don't know, like, uh, I I probably read the books or maybe i saw like cujo or pet cemetery i was just like you know because like when we were kids like stephen king you're right like he's one of the few one of the few authors that really does transcend being known as a writer and just the name alone is like is 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 sort of like a a celebrity or it's a stand-in for so much more and you know to me like stephen king was always synonymous with like the scariest shit imaginable like this 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 is a book or to see a stephen king movie or to read one of his books was really like to test yourself um, to, yeah. like, to to test your metal against just how much like you know horror uh, could pass through the membrane of your fragile youthful consciousness. <laughs> so yeah, like I think it was just like I mean like I th- like I think like the the first he, he's I think he's like among, among a lot of people I know he was probably like the first like adult author or like full mm-hmm. complete book that a lot a lot of a lot of people my age or like a lot of my friends. Uh, like you know, the first the first adult book that they picked up and read for themselves, you know, like uh, absent any school assignment or anything like that. Um, for me, I, I I was into I was into Michael Crichton before Stephen King. I liked I liked yeah. the, Same. The, the, yeah. more like the I read all the Michael Crichton books, and then yeah, like Stephen King, it was just one of those things like it just um, sort of you know like uh, passed around or whispered among friends, and just like you know I, I knew what he looked like. Um, but yeah, like he was just, he was just the, the name, like the brand for like American horror. And like I said, this, this sort of, uh, like now that you're uh, you know old enough to read books and you're sort of expanding your imagination, like, you know, okay, now you got to get into the, 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 the horror, the dark side, you know, like the, the real, the really scary shit. And yeah, like, so yeah. Like that, that was the fun part about reading it. And, and honestly, I was like a little disappointed because I, I thought it would be like, you know, opening the Necronomicon or something, but <laughs> You know, I read the Dead Zone and Salem's Lot, and I was like, I I, I like them, but they weren't like you know uh, madness inducing or anything. Yeah, those are <laughs> interesting gateway books for him because I mean, the Dead Zone for the most part, it's like, I mean, arguably his most adult book. I mean, I, it's it's it would be interesting to 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 read it, you know, growing up too, because it's just dealing with so many adult themes, and you know, it is very emblematic of King. But when you you know when you think of just the 
this sort of creep show king out there. It doesn't really yeah, yeah. get to that, you know? I guess Salem's Lot does in a way, but even that feels a little does, bit yeah. more adult too. Like, um, you know, and like, that's why I think like, I like the, the short story collection is pro- are probably a, they're a better, a better introduction to yeah. his, his body of work because yeah, like, I mean, like I, I really like the short story, um, medium, especially for the horror genre or like the, the horror anthology and the short stories are just really good. They really pack a punch and then, and then they do, they do get to the truly terrifying, uh, horrific shit a lot, a lot quicker. I was just, I was just thinking the other day, uh, do you guys remember, I think it was in Skeleton Crew, uh, the story of the jaunt about oh, teleportation. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. The jaunts. A really yeah. good one. Really good. It's brutal. One. Yeah. A really, really horrific ending to that story. And I remember being, yeah, very, that, that, that was, that was the one that like really like they did disturb me as a kid. Yeah. So here's a question that I think could segue into some larger discussions. They they there were talks for a while that they want to make the jaunt into like a TV series. Is that something you think benefits the story or hurts the story? I mean, I would like it to see it ad- adapted into like maybe that creep show series they're doing now, like if it was like an anthology horror series. But like to me, like uh, the story packs such a good punch because it's because it's like it's a, it's a, it's a set thing, and I just like I don't I don't know how they would um expand that concept into like a season's worth of television. Yeah, it, it it's it's interesting because it's like a lot of the stuff that makes that story work so well are the things that kind of like earworm into you where you kind of just like think about it like you know like the wife that's kind of just like existing out there in limbo forever. Like yeah. I just don't know how you convey that I guess on you I know, just, like, just yeah. the notion yeah. It's every, like that notion of living like a thousand years in the, yeah, in the yeah, course yeah. of one second. Yeah. Which like a, yeah, so every, every episode someone someone goes through the, someone gets jaunted um while they're still conscious and then uh, claws their eyes out as their mind is destroyed by <laughs> <laughs> Every episode yeah. ends the same. Yeah, they yeah. their eyes out. Um, so yeah, we talked about King as sort of this larger than life figure. I mean, if you think about it, he's been very ubiquitous for as long as all three of us, I think, have been alive. Uh, whether it's literature, film, TV, he's written dozens and dozens of books. He's acted in shows. He's I've been on every talk show imaginable. He's got a band. He directed a Hollywood movie. Like, do you think will based on the way culture is moving and and the ways in which we consume these days? Do you think we'll ever have like another Stephen King? Um, some, yeah, probably not. Uh, probably like I, I, I think like be, because like our culture is getting so post literary, it's very hard to imagine and any any American author uh, reaching that same level of celebrity. And I think like it, like the, the next like Stephen King fingers will probably be more like uh, movie directors or showrunners. You know, like uh, like a uh, Jordan Peele, like so someone of that nature. There's just like the the or it's become sort of synonymous with a genre or as a go to guy. But like, but still, it's just like it 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 it, it it'll be like uh, not nearly as big as Stephen King was, and it'll be like also it, it won't be. I I think it'll be so much of like a one man's like kind of like singular like vision and 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 taste like that is really. I mean, like like I said, like. Stephen King goes like he he is he is like the the American horror author like he is the one who like you know following on, in the footsteps of like you know Poe and H P Lovecraft is the one who really took horror into like a, a a really like mainstream and really popular context and that like has been so just so unbelievably prolific and you know like and also like I don't think they'll be just because of how many books he's written. But I don't think there'll ever be an author who's been has been as successfully adapted into film and television as Absolutely. Stephen King either. I don't think there'll yeah. ever be anyone close to that again. I mean, like, like I was trying to think the other day, like the authors that even come close, and right. it might it might be like Tom Clancy or someone like that. I know, or and, I mean, Michael Crichton, Michael Crichton too. Yeah, but him, Crichton, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like. Yeah, I think the the similarity between Crichton and King, because Crichton was my kind of gateway into adult literature as well, and for me it was Jurassic Park. It's like, well, absolutely, that was that was the first book I ever read on my own. Yeah, I was like, I was like, I was like, actually, like, I because I as a kid I was always like, you know, fascinated. I would like look at all these books on my parents' shelves and just like pick them up or like browse through the pages and just look like. God, these words, these, these these the words are so small. There's so many of them. They're on both sides. Like, do adults even like? How like do they, are they just this is just capping right? They're just pretending like they <laughs> they've actually sat down and like turned through all these pages and looked at the words and said them in their heads. It just seemed incomprehensible to me. And then yeah, Jurassic Park that was like the first book I read, and then I got it because I was just like you know flipping through the pages and like as I got like wore wore through the book and like the the pages to go got smaller and smaller. It was the first time I experienced a sense of like you know disappointment 
or like you know a sort of negative anticipation like oh like oh, i i don't want this to end i want this to keep going Oh, yeah. Right. I mean, and it's funny you mentioned Jurassic Park, because I think that when you think about trying to think of like some sort of equivalent to Stephen King, I mean, really, the only person I could think of is Steven Spielberg in that way of just being like yeah. that ubiquitous name. They both technically came to surface, you know, around the same time, 74 for King with Carrie, 75 with Jaws. Like they kind of have this wild run that is seemingly um, unparalleled unless you talk about someone that's, you know, from another era, like with King, you got like a Dickens. Right. And then with Spielberg, yeah. I guess what the closest is what like Cecil B. DeMille or something like that, or like, yeah. you know, or Hitchcock, like it's, it's like our artists, like artists who's run like define an entire era and everything that came after it. Yeah. So it's like, I, you know, it's, I don't not, think, yeah. it's like, a, I don't think it's like an American horror movie or horror, horror novel. Um, is just like in in in, in today's climate is just like invariably going to be compared to Stephen King and be yep. like in, in in his shadow in one way or another. Yeah, yeah, and along those same lines, uh, I think the other thing that distinguishes Spielberg or you know similar like makes him similar to Spielberg and King is the idea that they never told the well they kind of told the same story twice sometimes but their <laughs> material was varied enough that it felt like they were touching on multiple yeah. points of culture and it really becomes about the technique rather than the type of story they're telling it's like well yeah. they can tell many stories well and uh and that's i think too like if you look at king he's got carrie he's got shining but then it's like we get stand by me we get green mile we get and then mm -hmm. spielberg obviously is all over the place too and it makes me think about what you guys say about culture on your podcast a lot, which is that we're becoming increasingly um, uh, boxed in, mm -hmm. you know, more and more over time. People are, you know, taking cultural issues and political issues and using them to sort of divide up pop culture and say, well, this is for me. Like you guys were talking about the Northman on your episode and this notion of like, well, we can't enjoy the Northman because bad people like it, <laughs> you know? And um, and so it's like uh, with I guess like that, I feel like that has extended in some ways to authors who feel like, well, I have to have a brand. If I write horror, all I can write is horror. And, uh, you know, quick path to success is to do various template books like people like, um, you know, Clancy. I like Clancy, but he more or less writes template books. So whereas King and Spielberg have always been these like guys who tell very unique stories every time. Um, do you think that that's something we're missing in this culture too, where we don't have these directors that can, or directors or storytellers, showrunners, writers who can branch out into other genres in other ways? Yeah, I mean, I, I I think the King and Spielberg comparison is an interesting one because I mean, like the, the I mean, obviously like nobody associates. Um, Steven Spielberg with like you know uh, nightmarish horrors and the I mean he's more of a like I mean they're 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 both so distinctly American yeah in uh, their body of work. Well, he work. did direct Poltergeist. Yeah, oh, well, that's, no, no, he produced Poltergeist. Toby Hooper <laughs> yeah, directed. Yeah. Okay, there's a rumor. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, like um, but like you know, like Stephen King is, is is certainly. I mean, no, sorry, Steven Spielberg is certainly very capable of doing like you know horror and doing very, very frightening things in in his movies. But like, they both are just just like the consummate like American like myth makers who really defined so much of like the American like mythos and identity in uh, the latter half of the 20th century. And I think like, you know, like, like the, the era in which they came up in, like you said, like, like, or, like 74 and like that run they did, like, you know, through the eighties and the nineties. Um, like, they, I mean, I think they were riding the crest of like the, like the, the peak and then decline of like the true American monoculture, like the like, true American popular culture in the sense that mm -hmm. it, like defined our, you know, empire in the 20th century and global culture. So like I mean yeah like as as the monoculture breaks down I think like just I mean like you know and it's not like necessarily good or bad I just think right. it will it will necessarily lend itself to like you know there will not be like any any figures of like of that magnitude or like you know that like I said like that are such cultural touchstones you know because like when we were growing up it was like a Steven Spielberg movie no yeah, matter how exactly different yeah. the movies were it like that really meant something or like the Stephen King book or like based on the mm -hmm. story by Stephen King like that like that was like a that was like a, a really foundational touchstone that you could really even if you had no idea what it was you could really hang your hat on and you could really know what to expect and it really meant something I, I like to it's like to almost everyone yeah that's a great point because i think that the 70s is so you know when we think about the monoculture in the 70s it's such a different monoculture than today i mean i feel like when you think about the monoculture now, it's it's so corporatized and it's so um, it's so numbers based. Not to say that it wasn't in the '70s, but you always think of the '70s as this like freewheeling time. And like your point about 
it being a Steven Spielberg picture as opposed to what the idea or the, the germination of that pitch is. Like, I feel like in the, the 70s were, were kind of like a, an interesting mix, like a handshake mix of, all right, well, we want to make money on this, but we also really want to strive for the actual, um, the, the the impact, the creative impact that we're going to have behind the scenes in it. And like, you know, you could talk about Michael Shimino with like what happened with Chef Heaven's Gate and how the studio kind of pivoted over to the blockbusters that <laughs> Spielberg and Lucas were making. But I feel like, it, when you look back at King, he is riding that wave that happened in the late sixties with like Rosemary's baby and, uh, uh, the exorcist. And I think there's another one, the other or something like that, that, that were these like, like horror was being treated highbrow, you know, like, like critics were mm -hmm. loving it, but also the nation were it was a, na a national sensation. And nowadays I feel like that really only happens unless it's like some sort of thing that like, like like youth youth I always think of like young adults or like the like or like if the thriller if it happens to be on like the you know for a while it was like an Oprah's book list or something like that or something that was going to be able to tap into that culture or tap into the monoculture that had to be some had to have almost like some sort of corporate funnel for it if that makes any sense like hey can yeah. we market this Twilight is it marketable like Harry Potter is you know I always feel like they have some sort of template now that have to be by comparison whereas. 70s it almost felt like the creator spoke itself like it was like there was an appreciation yeah. for the creator almost. absolutely and like you know like if you think about that that era and um like king and and spielberg specifically i mean i think they really both were like inheritors and and communicators of like a moment in which like the you know the counterculture w was and like that sort of american new wave or like the the possibilities of like the, the the 60s and like the sort of utopian dreams had had curdled and were either becoming very dark or becoming very uh like commodified yeah and and like and i think stephen king and spielberg are really like the light and dark of that phenomenon and i don't mean that as an insult to, St to spielberg at all right but like i i just think of, I, th I just think of king's works as really like I, I think both of them really do channel the like the essential id of the American character and like our sort of self doubts and identity, and but but King is the one that really like pr pretty much exclusively shows the dark side, and I I mean I think of two things I mean I was like I was actually talking about Matt this the other week, um, just reading the book and he was like I remember this scene reading it in the stand as a kid and it just like stuck in my brain to this day it's the scene where like everything like you know everything has completely gone to shit and like the military like morale and discipline is broken down entirely and it's just like a public tv studio where like uh -huh. like black nationalist soldiers are just executing white people on television and i think uh what's her name maddie or something is watching it and she thinks it's a tv show but they're just pulling dog tags out of a out of a fishbowl and just executing white people on tv it's like it, it it's so i mean it's like uh, crass in a certain way but like uh, as matt described to me like king really lets you he lets you inside he mm -hmm. lets you inside like the, the the this is the fears of like you know like the like like uh, the white american apocalypse and he's not afraid to really go there and like you know unlock the door to what's inside him and then i also think about like you know in, in his books and movies it's such a prevalent theme throughout them i mean like if there is a thread that unites not not the majority but like i would say a good good portion of his work is this portrait of like small town America, totally. um, yeah. you know, whether, whether it's Maine or elsewhere, but like this idea that like in every town, you know, like with a full of, you know, sort of normal Americans, some people are pretty, are, are pretty good and nice, but some people are really cruel and like sadistic and evil. And it's just about like the circumstances. I mean, that's sort of what the stand is about. It's like under extreme circumstances, like these things that are, you know, uh, sort of buttoned down or, or just just you know just just under the surface become incredibly pronounced and it's this sense of like the, the this true uh, sadism and cruelty that is like that is lurking beneath this placid exterior of like American civic and public life for true fans of true crime the generation Y podcast is essential listening Hosts Aaron and Justin started it way back in 2012 to dissect some of the craziest and most notable murders, crimes, and conspiracy theories together. And 10 years later, they are still at it, unraveling a new case each week. They take on infamous cases such as the evil genius bank robbery, the Zodiac Killer, and the Tylenol murders. And they also cover lesser-known cases like the case of Kimberly Rico, aka the Valentine murder, where Kim takes her husband on a romantic week and then includes a murder mystery play that she of course uses as a cover-up to murder him for insurance money. The two go over every angle, breaking down theories, diving deep into forensic evidence, and interviewing those close to the case. And honestly, it feels like you're right in the room with them while they get into it. It is exciting, it is adventurous, it is informative. 
Follow the Generation Y podcast on Amazon Music or listen early and ad-free by joining Wondery Plus on Apple Podcasts or the Wondery app. Yeah, the that you made a great point in the idea of there's good people and there's bad people. In the world of King, it is that simple a lot of times. And I find that to be a really interesting uh, nugget in his work. And it specifically... Uh, there's a character named Henry Bowers who I talk about a lot in the pod. He's a bully. He's the local bully. And he is, uh, you know, such a piece of shit. He is so purely darkly evil. There is no human, like there's humanity in that he's well drawn, but this is a character who King essentially paints as one of the rotten ones. And that makes him, he wasn't corrupted by Pennywise, like, you know, the corrupting force in this town. He was already evil before Pennywise, like took, you know, kind of planted its hooks in him. And I think that's something that comes through a lot throughout his work. In The Stand, it's really interesting because it's this like apocalyptic event that motivates people towards good side, bad side, you know, dark man, old saintly black woman who believes in Jesus, you know? It's, um, it is this really interesting uh, uh, notion of good and evil. And I guess like, um, as we, I feel like we've entered a, a time in culture where uh, we've, we've um i don't know we're perhaps too empathetic as a culture to ever sometimes really uh paint portraits like fictional portraits uh with like you know evil and good and these kind of broader notions how do you think that sort of thing like manifests in culture now where we get so much gray area yeah um i don't know it's hard to say like i i just think of like all his characters that are like sort of small town tyrants and and sadists you know they get like disciplinarians and like whether they're whether they're cops or like sort of church 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 going people he really does like showing that it's it's it is almost always the people that are the most outwardly virtuous that yeah. are are really sadistic and cruel yeah. to to those that are weaker than them and like that's a real that like, i mean that's the theme in his book especially especially the books and movies about kids and i think that's probably yeah. why so many like adolescents and like boys especially are drawn to his work because i think he does very credibly render um, this kind of uh, like the this sort of uh, the, the the both the thrill of danger and just how powerless you are as a kid to like the, the these larger forces and adults around you. Um, I thought that was very profound. But like yeah, like I, th- I think it seemed like I think there's always kind of like the out the outside thing, the thing the thing that that sort of broaches our reality that is like the mm-hmm. the catalyst that 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 brings out like the the good and evil in people. But yeah, I mean I I, I don't think like and his good characters are not particularly goody two shoes either. I mean, like other than like you know saint, sainted yeah. mother Abigail, yeah. you know, like you think of like Larry Underwood. I mean, I think that's sort of like you know King King sketching himself in a way. You know, a guy who who could have gone in the direction of like you know fucking his life up with drugs and 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 fame and shit like that. But you know, is like basically when push comes to shove, a, a good person. And yeah, like I think I don't know. Like also, I'm just trying to think like. Yeah, he doesn't have a whole lot of uh, doesn't have a whole lot of gray. I mean, I think it's just like in his world, the good people appear outwardly gray because that's how normal people are, and the really right. evil people are the ones who only like appear and and you know sort of like rigidly enforce this um like outward virtue vir- you know virtue and 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 discipline and standards of behavior. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. I think of the myth specifically where the yeah, yeah. you know old religious woman basically starts a cult. Have you um have you seen like are you uh when it comes to movies, uh who do you think are the directors who perhaps best capture the essence of King? You mentioned Mick Garris, and we've talked about him a lot on the pod because I think for he kind of captures that creep show quality of King. Yeah. You know, like the like there's something very broad and I think thudding about a lot of Mick Garris's direction, but we still have a fondness for it because we feel like yeah, he has absolutely. a really strong connection to King. But of you know, he's obviously worked with all kinds, like you know, so many of Hollywood icons. Who are the ones who you think who do the best job with it? Well, I, it, it's it's an interesting question because I'm way way better versed in all the Stephen King movies than I am with his his novels. I mean, that's probably the primary way that I'm familiar with his work. And the thing is. He's like probably the the most adapted uh, author in into film or television, and the thing is like when you're talking about Stephen King adaptations, at least in movies, I would say the vast majority of them are like successful to quite good, and then like mm-hmm. the high the highest tier of them are among the best movies ever made. But the problem is it becomes a competition between the director and the writer, 
and like probably the best Stephen King movie, in my opinion, The Shining, probably has the least yeah. to do with Stephen King's like you know vision as an author. Famously so. I mean, he was like he didn't like it so much. He made a shitty TV version where like the guy from <laughs> fucking the guy from Wings is chasing Rebecca De Mornay around with a fucking croquet mallet, and you know like that was because like you know Jack Torrance was Stephen once again Stephen King kind of writing about himself. And, you know, like Stanley Kubrick's version, Jack Torrance is a piece of shit who is thinking about killing his family before he gets to the Overlook Hotel. Yeah. <laughs> and, there, and there's no redemption for him. And that, like, I think that fucked with Stephen King a lot. Yeah. But, like, yeah, like, it's it just, like, what, what, what is successful in film is, like, you know, in terms of, like, pure literary adaptation, like, often it, it behooves you to cut against the author. Like, I would say, yeah, Mick Garris really does have a good sense of Stephen King, but he's not a particularly good director. And, right. what, and what he does communicate is like often the very clunky and hokey parts of Stephen King that like that don't really translate into film that um, that seamlessly. Yeah. But, yeah, you know, like, good... but like, oh, you know, like, you know, like you talk about like the, the, the Stephen King like movies and directors. I mean, run down the list. You've got Stanley Kubrick, Brian De Palma, David Cronenberg and John Carpenter have done i mean i would would put those four guys i mean those are like four of my favorite filmmakers of all time like genius genius level auteurs so it's like very hard to pick against those being like the best stephen king adaptations but they're often i mean other than carrie really i i think like the the other ones don't the director's sensibility eclipses king's to a large degree but then there's Mm, like a there's all there's a whole host of like slightly like you know um like slightly under that tier of like not as well known directors, but like and, and movies that are kind of hokey, like a little bit corny, but still work, I think, beautifully as both films and movie and, and King adaptations like, you know, uh, like Lawnmower Man or Children of the Corn yeah. or Pet Cemetery, like, like sort of like, like th- that that tier of Stephen King adaptations. Yeah, I, yeah. I, the the idea of like I, I feel like the, with page to screen. And we just talked about this when we were going over uh, Cronenberg's The Dead Zone. He had this quote about William Goldman. That he, or I guess his takeaway from William Goldman was that you kind of have to betray the book to be faithful to the book. And yeah. I feel like Mick Garris doesn't do that usually because he's he's really usually faithful to the book. And then it gets kind of yeah. like, well, this doesn't really Sometimes translate. Too much, yeah, yeah, it doesn't translate too well on the screen. But I do think that some of the the best adaptations in the past have been ones that kind of follow that guideline that Cronenberg outlined right there, but also kind of there's like a, like we were saying with the gray area, there's a nuance to that as well. Like you kind of have to, you can't betray the book too much, but you got to actually, you know, there's some elements that you want to keep, but I do think making it in your own usually works. to its advantage. Cause like even with the shining, it's so distant and far from King's book, but thematically it's still kind of there, like, you know, at least aesthetically, like aesthetically there's, it's doing a lot of legwork to kind of capture some of the the themes that are within the book. But, um, I don't know. I, I, I feel like you get too literal. It could be, it's usually danger. I feel like when it comes to getting them to the screen. Well, actually, I think like one of the, one of the best, uh, Stephen King film adaptations that I think, um, you know, it is, 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 is quite literal, not an art film, but I think, one of the best films of all time, one of my favorite movies of all time, is of course *The Running Man*, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger, <laughs> yes. which is based on the Richard Bachman uh, yeah. Stephen King uh, book. And this is funny, actually. One time when I, the, the one time I went on RT, the RT network, which believe me, I still get shit about today, as you might <laughs> sure. imagine. Uh, well, well, I, I went on a Jesse Ventura's show because you know, to, uh, to talk to the body. I mean, come on, I'll, I'll you gotta. I'll, I'll, go, I'll, I'll go on any cable yeah. network to do that. I'll go on China TV. And, yeah. you know, I was I was like, I was sort of making the joke with him that, like, you know, the reality that we currently live in with, like, a, a game show host president does seem very similar to uh, The Running Man, which is a film that you started. And he was just going, <laughs> he was like, I was in The Running Man. And he was like, I don't know if you know this or not. Not many very people do. But did you know, do you know who Richard Bachman is? Or who the pen name <laughs> Richard? And I was just, I had to just like, I had to be like on his show. I had to be like. Yeah, yeah, Jesse, I know. It's it's Stephen King. It's Stephen, it's Stephen King. And he was like, not many people are aware of the documents that's been covered up that the Running Man is a Stephen King movie. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> it's like, um, it's like so right on the trivia for hear- IMDb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are you excited to hear that Edgar Wright is in the process of adapting The Running Man, a more faithful adaptation to King's book? Uh, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> We feel similarly. <laughs> I'm not. We're like, give us, uh, yeah, give us uh, the '80s version. We're big fans of that. Well, that's a um, perfect example. Yeah. It's just like I could, you uh, I made could, your own uh, thing yeah. with it. 
I I have liked Edgar Wright's movies in the past, but I, he is he is rapidly overstaying his welcome, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, I felt like my my biggest fear happened because I really liked Baby Driver a lot, and then I got to last night and I was like, eh, you're getting a little too cute, you know, you're you know you're going a little too far. With oh yeah, and, and you liked Baby Driver. <laughs> you, I did you thought like last Baby night Driver. in Soho was too cute. Okay, well, I stay did, away from I this did. movie <laughs> like the fucking plague. Yeah, you should then. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, so <laughs> uh, what are your thoughts on some of the recent King adaptations? Did you see like the two it movies? Do you think, uh, have you seen the new Firestarter that okay. came out last weekend? No, I, I haven't seen the new Firestarter. Although I heard that, uh, John Carpenter did the music for it. Yeah. So the score's not bad. Yeah. Score's pretty good. Okay. All right. So maybe I'll listen best, to the, I'll, maybe I'll just listen to the score. Okay. I thought the, okay. I thought the two new it movies were two of the worst movies I have ever seen in my life. Like See, I, I've I, said that I, about the second I, one. Yeah. Okay. No. No. The second one in particular. The first one. Yeah. Like it. it like it. It, it kind of worked because it was like it, it. It. It did feel like a Stephen King book. It was like the the kids, and there was just way less of that awful like CGI fucking like spider clown. It too was dreadful, dreadful. <laughs> and I, I remember like the exact feeling like because there's a scene where like they're, they're okay so they're they're adults and they all go back to the the town and there's like this it's just this contrivance so they're all like they have to go off on their own and they all know that Pennywise is gonna like scare them with some horrible haunting thing but it was like it just totally did away with like any sense of like being scared because mm-hmm. it just tells you like oh like okay like oh now it's this character gee I wonder what scary shit's gonna happen to them right. <laughs> and then it does yeah. and then it does and you're like oh okay well that that wasn't yeah I knew that was coming that wasn't very no I th- I, th- I thought it part two specifically was dreadful yeah it was a rough watch for me personally it's it's because there is the the sort of stink on a lot of modern horror uh, of wanting to build a franchise out of this, right? And there is this sense of unnecessary myth building that begins to happen in some of these movies that I feel, you know, has an Ab- Abrams kind of quality to it, like a mystery box kind of quality to it. But I don't know if you heard, like they're doing an HBO series that's like a prequel to it. And then the Salem's Lot movie that's coming out. Oh, yeah. This Ugh. fall is yeah <laughs> is directed by the guy who wrote it chapter two, and he also mm. worked on like the Annabelle movie. So this is a guy who is very firmly in the pocket of like franchise horror. Like this is uh, which is very much what um, people want, and so I'm well not people but studios and you know and uh, they want more IP. And one of the things that's been interesting for Mike and I and the rest of the podcast is because you know we go through things chronologically, but we also talk about the new movies when they come out and there has been this like insistence um this desperation almost to uh because king is a marketable name but he needs stronger ip right so it's like pennywise is something they want to spin off into a series because they want to have that like harry potter kind of uh franchise that they can work and they tried it with dark tower they failed uh they keep trying to build a king franchise and i think that's my uh, worry about Salem's Lot coming up is that that's such a great contained horror story. You know, it's a vampire story. It works on its own. And I am dreading whatever little thing that they're going to slip in there to try to turn it into a series. Yeah. Uh, because, and I think that's a tough thing with King is you're basically taking his idea and you're trying to spin it into more elaborate myth making out of that. So, an it prequel, what's it called? The? Come on. <laughs> Come on, people. Come on. <laughs> Well, one of the best parts of it is that you kind of you get a glimpse at the kind of almost Lovecraftian uh, will drive you mad if you saw the real thing version of whatever it was that it came from. And now I'm like, they're going to build a whole series around that and totally ruin it. You know? Well, that's just, and and it's also like, uh, like it's, it's the over literalization of the indescribable madness, like creature, you know, itself. It's just like when, when it's so, was just sort of like over rendered in this horrible CGI, you know, uh, atrocity. It just it robs it of any anything that's actually scary. It's actually genuinely scary and very good about the idea behind it. Um, yeah, so uh, no, I'm not thrilled about that. But like, I mean, honestly, like the the way to do it, uh, you know, as I said at the beginning, like there are so many of his short stories that are like some of them are already right. being adapted into that Creep Show series, um, yep. which is like you know it's it's not very good, but. I mean, if they just did like a King anthology series that just adapted different one, different like we've you know, wondered that too. Yeah. Like, why don't they do more King stories on that show? 
It's yeah. yeah, they do like one and then they'll just do a bunch of random things. Um, yeah. Like I'm curious for you. What is it you look for in modern horror? Like if you're looking for a modern horror movie, a modern horror novel, what is it you look for? What do you enjoy these days? Um, I, I think like, um, I mean, I mean, it depends. Like, it just it, you know, it's just it's about the quality of um, like the, the the script and the director. But like, I mean, like, and, and not in every case. Like, I don't, I don't want to be like you know too heavy handed about this. But I think like sure the 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 best horror. Like, I I I am a little I'm a little bit tired of horror movies that are like about trauma. Oh my god! Or we're like yes. or we're like god. we're like the it's just like the indescribable thing is like you know a metaphor for like grief or something depression, like that. Yeah. yeah, grief or depression, and I I I like it a little too polished, a little too just a little too pretentious. Like I, yeah. I you know I like um. You know, um, like I, I, you know, like, and, and that was like what I, what I liked about a lot of the like the earlier Stephen King movies is that like their their lack of pretension and that like that that classic right. kind of like EC comics like uh, just a sense of humor too, like a lot a lot of these horror movies like like and I, and I don't mind something that's like like truly bleak and despairing if 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 I think it's like earned it or whatever but i think a lot of the times that just it, it becomes pretentious and not really frightening and I, I i like and like that's what i like about Stephen king is that like he's he's not afraid to have a sense of humor and have that that kind of like you know crypt keeper oh, yeah. uh um that that that, that the, the, the irony and 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 just the fun with it you know like i want to see some good like some some good like you know some some good gore and but like to me like like a good horror movie and a good comedy are really like inspire the same feeling. It's just a question of like yeah. how, how they use timing and editing and like the artistry of the medium to elicit an involuntary response from you, be it laughter or, you know, or terror. And then often like, you know, the older I get, like to me, like the, the feeling is, is almost exactly the same. Like when I see something yeah. really, really scary or gruesome in a horror movie now, if I'm in the theater, especially with other people, like I just start laughing. Yeah. Like, yeah. That, that, like that's the feeling I, I, I'm going for that I'm looking for in in contemporary horror oh absolutely. yeah i mean i remember i remember being at like uh our theater in town mike when we watched the beyond like lucio falci's the beyond and then when the spiders oh, start so eating good guys so eyes, good oh just, my like, god cheered, yes you know? great. <laughs> yes yes just tarantulas just like, chopping down on that guy's face yeah uh, yeah, but I mean, that's the, it, you just don't really get that as much anymore because, I mean, it's funny you mentioned comedy too because it's like, I mean, you could even just kind of, I mean, I, the biggest question everyone always asks now is like, what was the last great comedy? And, you know, eventually someone will be like, well, Game Night was fun. And it's like, well, yeah, that was a one movie that was in 2018. And it's like, we don't really get a lot of comedy and we don't get, a, you know, I feel like horror doesn't even really go for the jugular because I feel like we just are, are such a culture obsessed with examination and like having some sort of deeper meaning. I mean, even with the yeah. bullshit Marvel Self movies, well, like think about the bullshit Marvel movies. I can't fucking stand them anymore. And like, I, and the, the one of the reasons why I can't even handle it is that like, everyone has to have some fucking backstory. It's like, there was a, like, why can't you just have a villain come out and be fucking evil? Like, why did it, is it that <laughs> yeah, hard? Well, right is it like that. that hard to do that where like, even like someone who's the big guy that has the the stones they all had to get. Um, is it a, oh, a thing? Yeah. Even he has a, a traumatic backstory. It's just like, I don't need this. Like just give me yeah, the bad and, guy. And especially, like, and especially in horror, like, you know, like with, with, with it part two, it's just like, over explanation and like uh yeah. filling filling and making everything a prequel is like lore like oh how did penny lies become the, yeah, an exactly. evil demonic clown you know it's like i don't feel like, like not only do i not fucking care but, yeah. it, but it robs it robs like the actual heart like like what, what is actually horrific about it 100%. you know like i think like everyone you know i mean obviously like king is indebted and everyone is in, in, in american horror to a large you could hp lovecraft and like yeah. you know I, I know a lot more about love I've, I've read pretty much all of lovecraft and you know like the thing about cosmic horror is that like it, it is it is about what is not explained mm -hmm. it, and it, it is about the the the, the in, like the indescribable and like you you can't the thing is like you have to give people something like uh, like there is like you know quite a bit of mythos that is laid out and like even connecting through all of Lovecraft's stories but it's mostly it, it's just like it's 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 at like you know it's at the edges of your perception or yeah. awareness of it and like that that is what is so unnerving and uh, like the special power that it holds that is uh, greatly diluted by, you know, over visualization, over explanation. And, you know, like just think of the, um, you know, to me, like probably like one of the most iconic images in all horror movies, the 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 elevator blood scene in The Shining, yeah. which, is, which mm -hmm. is not in the book. And it's just like the power of that image is so stunning because it's just like, what is this? Like, what does yeah. it mean? Like, like what, like what, like what, like what, like. 
Like, and it's, it stands apart from everything else in that movie. Everything else yeah. in that movie. Because it is so, like, it so defies any explanation or analysis, really. But the power yeah. of the image is just, it, it's just so startling that, like, the, the meaning you create for it is, is there and it's deep. But it's not a meaning right. that you can really communicate. No. Yeah, like, you never see the splatter from the blood later, right? It is no. an image that existed in that one shot. And that's and it's the same thing why everyone loves the, the dog man getting the blowjob or whatever. It's like, because it, it's a thing yeah, that yeah. exists in a single moment and it doesn't need that explanation. I'm, well, you mentioned, I'm, uh, you mentioned uh, Lovecraft, oh, ahead, and, I, and, that, and he, that's what he's so good at. I mean, like, I think of, like, the color out of space. It's just the rock of landed and then the effects of that. You don't need to know where the rock is from. You don't need to know even with the science behind it. It's just terrifying to know that, all right, well, this thing's happening. It seems to be affecting the nature around it. The, the plants are moving for some reason. The rabbits are going fast. I don't know why, but it's very scary. And the imaging, the images are haunting. And it's been 30 years since I first read it. And I still remember those images. And it's like, it's because yeah, it embeds like, in your head. You know, and yeah. with and with Lovecraft and like, you know, obviously King is very indebted to him in this regard. But it's also the oh, idea yeah. that like, you know, they're like they're they're They were like Lovecraft and then and then King after him. Uh, you know, he took the ball and really advanced it a great degree in American horror because they were moving away from like the gothic era of horror. Yeah, uh, they were moving away from ghosts and this sense of like being haunted by you know, uh, like, you know, uh, I don't know, like uh, haunted by like repressed memory mm -hmm. and like this gothic sense of, of good and evil and like fate and, and destiny and, 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 you know, like, and the, 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 this dramatic pathos that was in like gothic horror and moving it into real, in a realm of almost pseudoscience fiction, because in like in Lovecraft's work, it's not, it's not Satan. It's not demons that are like haunting this world we live in. They're like basically an alien race that is like, ancient and unfathomable to our consciousness and like like that like that to me is the power of cosmic horror is that these things are not good or evil they are just as beyond Larger our comprehension yeah. like as beyond our comprehension is yep. like an ant is to us mm -hmm. yeah and that's how you know he toys with that like i think about jerusalem's lot which is this a, a short story that's a prequel to salem's lot but is you know, very loosely connected, but that's a very Lovecraftian horror story. There's no vampires in it. It's about a larger presence that lives kind of, you know, within the fabric of, of the of space and time. Yeah. And King really toys. That's probably his most straight Lovecraftian story that he's ever written, Easily. but he toys yeah. with it all the time. Like in re even revival, which came out, I believe in what, 2012, like uh, that book um, very much deals with Lovecraft, but that's one of his, you know, last, I think probably his last great horror book that he's written and one thing I've noticed about King, and I think this is an interesting thing about spending my whole life with an author, uh, watching their, them evolve over time, is watching sort of, you know, the circumstances of their own life and, and just their general sense of um, easing into time, taking hold. In King's early works, like The Stand that you're reading, there's this like intense paranoia. There's an anger about the world. You read his later books and they're so interesting because there's not that. Like in the world of King, uh, like in these later, like his last couple books, like he can't write a book without mentioning Donald Trump anymore, you know, and <laughs> talk about and talk about how Hillary should have won in 2016. Like he's very much become like an old neocon boomer. Or not neocon, Leo Lib Boomer, which is fine. It's like uh, he seems happy, but I always talk about how I miss the angriness yeah. and the paranoia that's so baked into his early stuff. And even just watching Firestarter, which came out on Friday, you know, the villain of that book is is government intelligence. It's Black Ops. And they basically, in this new version of it, like that book was written in the wake of MK Ultra, and it's very much influenced by that. But the new one, they like one of the things we talked about in our episode is they they barely, barely, barely even acknowledge that the villains are part of the government. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's that's something interesting. that is, yeah. That, I, you know what it is? I mean, like, yeah, like he's a, he's a very successful guy. He's a very happy guy. He's a very, a very admirable guy in a lot of ways for like a, someone who's yeah, that famous. Absolutely. Like he, he seems like a pretty normal guy, you know, and I've always admired that about him. Totally. Uh, I think, I think King, he lost his edge when the Red Sox won the World Series. Because once that happened, <laughs> once that happened, it was like America, the world, it, it is fine. It's like it's like that's that is what I attribute to. If he has lost his sense of anger and paranoia about the world, <laughs> it's that the Red Sox won the World Series after beating the Yankees four games in a row in the in the ALCS. 
Yeah, and then one again three years later. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. So, like he, so it's, it's like it's all gra- it's all gravy for him now, you know. So yeah. I mean, like, so if he do- if he doesn't have that that mad that mad friction anymore, well, it's also probably because he's not like you know snorting coke through a garden hose anymore. But <laughs> I don't know. Maybe he still gets zooted. I'm I'm, I'm yeah. not sure. But yeah, but it it's just like no, you know. Yeah, he's, uh, yeah. No, like everything in the world does make sense now. All, all of the indescribable mm-hmm. horrors are, are gone now if you are a nice New England boy who gets to see the Red Sox win the World Series twice after trouncing the Yankees. Well, you know, it's funny because we're at an interesting part. In his, we do a chronological reread of his books. We've been doing it since 2017. And we just, uh, we're, we're basically right after the car accident in 99 that almost killed him. And we're, we've, we're a few books into sort of that post period. And it's been really interesting to see how his entire perspective on the world and mortality and fear of death has really crept in. And, uh, but we are about to enter into the end of the dark tower, which he finished kind of rapidly after the accident, because he was afraid he never would, because he thought about dying now. And then, um, and then he followed that with his book about the Boston Red Sox, which is called Faithful, yeah. which is a nonfiction book he co-wrote. So we're about to hit that point. And I'm, I'm now going to test your theory and see where is his work shifting after that well um, i'm thinking of like stuff that happened when he was you know the thing that could really get under his skin as a red sox player i mean think about with buckner in 86 and what novels come around like 87 88 for him I and mean, it's like when he starts getting really just dist- i mean he does it at the, it's the same year so he'd already written it but like he gets misery. into like the misery the dark hat like some really like Tommy dark novels. fucking stories that i'm sure like I don't know. The the baseball thing's an interesting uh, theory. I never thought about that, and it's it it does make a, t- a ton of sense timeline wise. Um, for um, it. as we wind down here, Will, I have like one last question I want to uh, kind of pose to you, and this is just I think a larger thing. Because one thing that King won't really touch in a lot of his books, and he's been, he keeps writing new books, he'll incorporate the internet. But he used to be this guy who could take any technological innovation and find a way to say this is why. We're scared of, uh, you know, where the future is going. I mean, Family Guy made a joke about that, but it's like uh, he won't really touch the Internet in terms of horror stories. And I feel like most authors are afraid to touch the Internet in horror stories because uh, I feel like there's no good Internet horror. And I guess uh, my question to you is, yeah, like, no, what, yeah, do yeah. Think, what do you make of that? I mean, like it, it doesn't surprise me in the slightest. And I think two things are going on here. Like one he's a boomer so like the internet it like the entire shift in our culture that the internet has caused is one that he experienced like after becoming a fully formed adult and like for our generation like i don't know how old you, you old you guys are but like i remember a time before the internet but i was young enough that like i experienced all of it like i experienced like yeah totally like, like you know like i went through like every every phase of the internet being introduced into life and culture and now taking advantage of it so like yeah, yeah like 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 you know anyone of a certain age like past a certain point like huge tectonic cultural and technological shifts become sort of bewildering to you or it's just not it's just not your wheelhouse but i think secondly and probably more importantly and this is certainly true in movies as well the internet is just not like in computers in general just do not lend themselves to um literary or cinematic horror or anything like just anything visually or intellectually interesting really at all you know like just like like i mean the fact that like everyone communicates now uh, via text messaging rather than having a phone call. So so in a film set in the present day, and this is, again, I, ha- I have to credit Matt Christman for making this point, but it's a very good one. Movies set in the present day that have to render the way people communicate to each other now on screen, it's it's dead as shit. Like, it's just, there's, <laughs> there is no way to render it interesting visually. And, like, as far as the internet, like, as, you, you know, you'd think it would lend itself to, like, kind of like you know cosmic or lovecraftian horror but like it, it really hasn't and I'm, I'm glad more people aren't trying because it's just i don't know like it's just it's 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 sterile in a way like it's just it, it's just it's it's not interesting the juice isn't there or like yeah. or, or if it or if it is a, it hasn't been really i mean the only really like brilliant horror movie that like uses computers or the internet in any interesting way is uh kiyoshi kurosawa's pulse which is oh, like a, so yeah, it's probably is one of my great. favorite, probably one of my favorite movies ever made. Certainly one of my favorite horror movies of all time. That's the only one I can think of, and it's done in that movie to astonishingly brilliant effect. But that's the only one I can think of of like that has right. sort of used the like the ambient proliferation of screens and frequencies 
and just sort of like uh, like sort of like digitally mediated reality um to like render visually and intellectually like any kind of uh, really affecting or uh, emotionally interesting horror yeah because you want to see too like what is the emotional effect it's having on people and what that movie does really well is it shows the isolation and the sense of drift Mm -hmm. like out of yeah yeah absolutely yeah um have you seen we're all going to the world's fair which just came out no, I haven't seen that. That's it's not a horror movie. It's kind of but it's funny because it's kind of marketed like one because I think they don't know what to do with it. But I will say it is a very, very good movie about the Internet. And it is scary, but it's just not a horror movie in the way I think we and I think that's kind of the point is that I think the kind of horror that really lends itself real life horrors like creatures that fucking come out of the earth or come down from the sky. That's, I think, the stuff of really great horror. Obviously, it can be many things. But when you're dealing with a, a digital presence, it's the difference between CGI and, and real life. You know, we're we're losing kind of that tactile nature of horror, I think, once we put yeah. it online. And that's, I think, what, you know, King was so good at doing so well. But but yeah, um, I'd yeah, recommend absolutely. that. But yeah, well, this has been an absolute blast. Thank you so much for taking the time and chatting with us about King. This has King. been great. Um, yeah. And uh, is there anything you want to plug before you head out? Just uh, chop out Trap House. You know where to find it. Uh, please uh, uh, listen and subscribe if you're not doing so already. Yeah, you should. It's great. Uh, thanks so much, Will. We'll see you later. Cheers, Have guys. A thanks a lot. I got some hot friends. God, I got some hot friends. I got some hot friends. God, I got some hot friends. This is the end of our show, for now. Tune in next week. If you like our programming, consider searching for other bloody disgusting podcasts, such as Creepy, Horror Queers, The Boo Crew, SCP Archives, Nightlight, Margaret's Garden, and more.